going to turn to Johan Lundgren, uh, Chief Executive of EasyJet, and I'm actually going to sort of, in a sense, pick up on some of the stuff we've been talking about, because, uh, I mean, you know, your industry's been decimated by the absence of travel. Now, we all hope and expect that on the 17th of May we will be able to start travelling abroad a bit more. What do you know... I mean, that's only, what, you know, 12 days away. <laughs> what has the government told you about, you know, the... The, the, the logistics, you know, what we're all going to have to be going through in order to get abroad, which countries, the processes, all of that. Well, it's very clear that we all, you know, need certainty on this. I mean, we as companies, but also consumers. Mm. There's, there's uh, you know, millions of people out there who's waiting to see, you know, whether they can book and make arrangements for their, you know, well-earned holiday and go and see family but and friends. what do you know? We're 12 days away. What have you been Europe. told so far? Well, we haven't been told, you know, many other things than you already know. We know that there's a tiered uh, risk framework in place with categorization of what will become a green uh, bucket and an amber bucket and a red bucket of destinations and countries who will be in there. And that will determine what type of restrictions we will be in place you can yeah. travel for. But we don't know what countries will go into <laughs> what buckets. And we actually don't know either at what stage they will have a look at what the restrictions will be and how they intend to unwind them. You know, just but what about the week. mechanics of how much bureaucracy there'll be, how they're going to deal with yes. queues at airports? I mean, do you know about any of this stuff? Yes. No, we don't know enough of this. And this is one of the, the irony that, you know, at the same time as we're seeing now that member states in Europe, and, and partly as a, you know, a, a recommendation from the, the Commission here, is starting now to open up for people in, in, in Europe to travel without any restrictions at all if they are vaccinated. So this risks actually leaving. So you do British understand people. more about how you'll be operating within the EU than you currently know about what you can do with British passengers. Yes, and it shouldn't be that way because UK had, through the extraordinary successful vaccination programme, should be able to take the lead in opening up travel in a safe way. So there's a lot of things that we're waiting to hear. And, you know, our, our own analysis, and, and there's been a, a study that's been performed by the faculty of Yale a School of Public Health, shows that you could put much of Europe into what is called now the low-risk green category uh, uh, of countries, which means that you can travel safely to and from these countries without that having any impact on the hospitalisation rate in, in the UK. So that's what we're waiting for. Well, we're pretty for. certain that the government is not going to put most of Europe in the green category. Well, we need to see what evidence they have based that on. Because what I'm lacking is that what is the evidence and the rationale from a scientific medical point of view why that isn't the case. There are many cases in Europe where you could travel to and from. They wouldn't perform any more risk that you would travel from London to Cornwall. So why would you treat you know, international travel from low-risk countries in a different way than you're opening up the economy here? And, and, and We've got to go back in a second. There will be lots more from you later, but one very quick one. I mean, just in terms of, you know, essentially what governments have told their people, are you seeing many more bookings in Europe for EasyJet than you're seeing bookings in the UK? Well, in the later week, we have. Yeah. Because basically, you know, the member states have said that, look, there will be no expensive, and in many cases from low-risk countries, mm. unnecessary PCR testing. Mm. You know, there's a complete disconnect. So there's less people... PCR testing in Europe? Well, there's, there's no be. PCR testing request required in Europe if you're vaccinated. Okay. So we're looking for UK to reciprocate that, of course. Otherwise, you know, millions of people will be left behind and there will be other member states who will make all the bookings and take the beds and the hotel rooms here. You know, and, and why shouldn't people benefit from the huge success of the vaccination programme if it is proven safe that it can be done? Sure. Listen, I've got, I've got lots more questions to ask you. Please don't go away. Lots more from the boss of EasyJet and Gavin Barwell, Tom Watson. Don't go away. Welcome back. In just a moment, I'll be talking more about where and how we're going to... Well, you know, if we're going to get foreign holidays this summer with the EasyJet boss, Johan Lundgren. But first, Anushka. Thank you. I want to show you some data linked to what you've been discussing about government rules on holiday and starting with where it is that people actually want to go. Skyscanner have shared which destinations are trending at the moment in the UK. So for couples, they have Tenerife up there, a nice romantic trip to Rome in Italy, Santorini in Greece for groups, slightly different mood, Malaga, Ibiza and Alicante in Spain, Faro in Portugal and Krakow in Poland. And for families, Lanzarote or Orlando coming up a lot. People really want to go to Disneyland. Now, what is the chance? Well, as you've been hearing, the green, amber and red system 
is likely to be based on data. And here's what we're looking at. So look, this is the number of COVID cases in different countries going up by the axis. And this is the vaccination rate. The more vaccinated the country is, the further to the right. So the lowest holiday hopes are up here in the left hand corner. I wouldn't be too hopeful about Ecuador, Costa Rica or even Croatia right now. Certainly not India either. Some of those popular destinations I just mentioned, Italy, Greece, Portugal, they're around here. So probably not quite far enough um, to be getting onto the green list, but very, very low. The real holiday hopes are all over here. And America is actually quite a long way in that direction. Disneyland might happen. Israel, Maldives, or if all of that is a bit out of budget, how about a staycation? Robert. <laughs> I think there's going to be probably quite a lot of staycations. Um, Johan, very good to, to chat over some of the issues around um, all of this. Let's just look at um, the costs of tests. How worried are you? I mean, if you look at the rules, even in green countries, the government has said you've got to have a test before you go out, you've got to have one when you come back. I mean, this is a big cost for families, isn't it? Yeah. First of all, there's no evidence that from a low-risk countries that you should need to do a PCR test. Quite simply. So you want there the is... government to abandon that requirement? Well, you know, a two lateral flow test would be as you know, efficient as a PCR test. And we're talking from the green low-risk countries. Well, two metrics that is important, and I think about the chart we saw here yeah. earlier on, when it comes to what are the things that actually can jeopardise and is critical to protect mm. UK and the hospitalisation rates. Because that's what the government is focusing on, quite rightly. It is the vaccination in this country that matters and the prevalence of the infections and various of concerns in the other countries yeah. that varies. So if you're taking that into consideration, that means that you could open up you know, most of Europe to do that. So on the testing side, I went on to the website you know, today and the average price is still about for a PCR test about £100. Sure, there's one or two suppliers who can offer that for 45 and 50, but you know, the UK government is still charging VAT on that. Mm. It's one of the few governments who's doing that. Yeah. So I think that the idea that you think that you know, people can afford to pay these amounts that goes far over and above what the average fare is of, a, of an easy flight, as an example, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that is, it is an issue. And just give us um, a sense of how much less we are expecting in this country to currently travel. So your forward bookings at the moment from Britain, I mean, what sort of, how, how much lower are they than in a typical year? Well, we're in a close period right now, so oh. we don't give any guidance for forward bookings. But, but clearly, you know, this is a you know, heavily impact on, on really the, the mm. fact that people don't know. We know one thing. There's a massive pent-up demand for people to travel. It comes out actually as number one thing that people want to do mm. after the lockdown to go away on, on, on that break. And also, this is not only about holidays. This is about people who have family members who sit across Europe that they haven't seen for over a year. Businesses who, who, who wants to reconnect to do also their thing. So we need much more clarity around this as well and use data and the scientific evidence to safely restart travel in the same way the government is doing to reopening the economy in a successful and managing the risk in doing that as well. And just back to a couple of the practical issues, are you assuming that people will have to wear masks all the way through their journeys? Uh, it, it depends on, I think it depends on, you know, what restrictions will be in place and that depends on the local situations. Uh, I think we are all for, you know, the, the relevant, you know, uh, adequate measures to be in place mm. in order to continue to protect the, you know, health and safety of people and, and the, the NHS and the equal healthcare systems around Europe. But I do think that, you know, uh, as the vaccination rolls out now also mm. across you know, the, the, the remainder of, of Europe primarily, because that's what we are focusing on, you're going to see that much will go back to some type of normality that will not be very different for, to what it was prior to the pandemic, I believe. And then just, just finally... And the key to that yeah. is the vaccination programme, of course, and the success of that. Sure. Um, everything we've been talking about, of course, it comes down to passengers being able to prove that they've had vaccinations or they're COVID-free. Uh, there's all this talk of a so-called passport, you know, probably something on your iPhone that proves that you've had the vaccination. But again, we have no idea what the system actually will be. Only 12 days to go. No, we don't. And, and uh, most likely, and this is, by the way, not only a UK issue. This, this is the same thing in, in, if you look across Europe. 
I mean, there was criticism to the, mm. to the European Commission that mm. they didn't have a common solution. Well, they brought forward the common solution on the digital green certificate. Mm. And now there are member states who say, well, you know, the situation is different in our country. We're not sure we can introduce mm. it in that way. And that tells you some of the, the risks on that. You know, you point a finger at somebody and the thumbs point back at yourself. <laughs> so, but I do think that, and I speak to ministers in governments across mm. Europe on a weekly basis, that there's an extraordinary now push leaning forward, you know, action oriented way of reopening travel in a safe way. Yeah. And I think that means that you will see some variances on how people are being asked to show their proof of, of the vaccination or if they had the virus or not. But if that is what it takes to get this started in a safe way, then, then that's what we've got to live with. Johan, very good to see you again. And, uh, well, who knows, next time you come back, maybe there will be some, some travel. Yes. Fingers crossed. Yeah, thank you.